says that there was going to be this, now understand, the false prophet is going to be the one who is going to say that you have to receive the mark. That's why this teaching that I'm giving you is important. I always thought that this person with the second, the second beast was the Antichrist. This second beast is the false prophet. And he is going to cause people, he is going to be the religious uh, companion to the Antichrist to meet his goal. He gets his power from the Antichrist. It says it here that he what? He exercises all the power of the first beast. He gets his power to do the miracles, not from God, but from the Antichrist. The Antichrist is using this tool to draw people towards him. He needs people to follow him, so he's got to create a persona of godliness. How do we know that? Because he stands in the temple and says what? Not I'm the devil. He says I am God. So he, this is beautiful church, he needs a spiritual representation to help him deceive the people. Because he is a political leader. He is not a religious leader. So the devil's not stupid. Understand, he knows what he's doing and he knows what he's trying to do. The only thing that makes him stupid is he already got kicked out of heaven. And he thinks he can come out against God again and somehow win. That's insane. He flicked you out so fast. Like, remember, anybody seen lightning? We had a lightning storm last night on our way home from the lake and it was like amazing. Like a flick, gone. And to experience that power of being thrown out of heaven and still think that you have the power to come against that same guy, that's stupid. But he is very cunning, crafting, and crafty, and insidious. And he is going to do whatever it takes to deceive you. If you know this and you know that he's just crafting, crafty and cunning, you have to, with everything in your power, know as much about God as humanly possible. And you know what? We're not doing it. I'm feeling convicted myself right now because I'm not even doing it enough. And I, and I study pretty hard, but I still have time. I mean, there's nothing wrong with entertainment, having some kind of fun, but there's got to be a balance. And many of us are out of balance. All we want to do is be entertained or we want to get ourselves involved in our family lives or our work lives or whatever it is we're doing, but we're way out of balance with knowing and trusting and learning God. Why am I teaching this? Because we've got to get in balance, church. We have got to get in balance. We've got to be balanced. It's okay to have fun. It's okay to be entertained. But we've got to be careful what we're doing it with. Because we've got a devil who is constantly on the watch. He doesn't give up. Just when you think he's leaving you alone, he was taking notes, watching, looking for any weakness. He is a master, master war, what do you call him? War people, war general, whatever you want. He's a master at tactics. He's looking at all of your weaknesses. The only thing he's not is omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at once. Oh, but he, can, he got the minions looking at you. And they're reporting back to him, taking notes on every weakness you have. If that's the truth, and if he is a master general at war against you, and you don't know the first thing about battle, you don't have any weapons. Come on, I just felt this, oh my goodness. If you don't have weapons, you don't know how to fight, you don't know the tactics, how in the world are you going to win that fight? How are you going to win that battle? How are you going to be able to take out the devil in your life? If he is a master, that, that he becomes the Navy SEAL and you become the Boy Scout. How, you have no chance. You have no chance. If, oh see now that, this is not fun teaching. You know, people, people, all they want to hear is no matter what you're going to make it, God did it. None, there's nothing you have to do. Oh God did it all. God did it all so you have access to the victory. But you have got to get your weapons. You've got to get your tactics. You've got to get your strategy on how you are going to win this war. If you don't understand how this, there is a false prophet. Not only do you have an antichrist working against you, but you have got, uh, you got the general, let's say if you make the Satan the general, then you've got a lieutenant called the false prophet. 
And he is going to have the appearance of godliness. He's going to do miracles and he's going to say, now follow that beast. The devil knew that it would be too difficult to get people to follow him directly. So he had to get a partner, a religious spiritual leader to convince the masses, I am the one you need to follow. Worship me. I am who I say. You know what comes to mind when I think about that? Is that when he says that he is God, people are going to question you know what? I love preaching because this stuff just comes out. Because when you talk about the Word of God, and when I preach, I put myself right there at the moment. And I'm thinking that when people, if he, come on, somebody hear me. If he needed to have a spiritual leader, a lieutenant, that means that he didn't, he wasn't confident he could do it himself. Oh, come on, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Put yourself in the place, church. If he didn't feel confident that he could draw people himself, he needed. A helper. So that, that tells me that based on looking at the situation, people are going to question when he says, I'm God. They're going to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't got no robes on and, and wait, 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 wait. You, you, do you know the Bible? Do, what, what, what's going on here? What, what do you mean you're God? So he needs this spiritual leader to do the miracles. Oh, come on, somebody hear me. This just lays it out for you. He is going to have someone to hocus pocus you right into faith and believe him. They're going to believe the false prophet. They're going to trust in him because he's going to do the godly things and then say, now follow him. You believe me that I am a, a prophet of God? Now I'm telling you that man who said he was God, that's exactly who he is. And that's how he's going to catch the church. That's how he's going to catch the church. Now, apostolic Pentecostals who believe in Acts 2.38, understand that you have to be saved by repentance, baptism, receiving the Holy Ghost. Those that understand the concepts of the oneness of God and that there's only one God and understands the idea that you have to have baptism in order to be saved because it washed away your sin. Those that are in that realm will not be so easily fooled. You're not, yeah, I, not only will I question, but I look at the Word of God and go, oh, you're standing in a temple, huh? Oh, you're calling yourself God, huh? Oh, I see, guess what? I know who you are, liar. You're the devil, and I'm not going to worship you. I'm not going to follow you. I'm not going to trust you or your false prophet. You better be thanking your lucky stars you're up in this place. I don't know about lucky stars, but <laughs> you ought to be thanking God that you have been given the doctrine that Paul was delivering to the people in the early church. There is going to be people who are going to receive. Now listen, how easy is this going to be? Hear me close. I said it's not going to be so easy to fool the apostles, but how easy is it going to be to fool people who are already told that sin is a natural part of your life? You sin every day. Now I'm not saying I believe that. I'm saying this is the comment that's made by what I call modern day Christianity. Anybody who teaches, if you don't realize this right now, anybody who teaches that you sin every day is a natural part of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Anybody who teaches that is a false prophet. Because Jesus didn't come for that. He did not come for you to be free in your sin. He came to you to be free, free from sin. To deliver you out of bondage. To say, no, go sin no more. Take my power and be delivered and have victory. But if you believe already, if you already believe, to ladybug, the ladies flock to me. If you already, I just put it in my pocket too, I did. If you already believe that false prophecy, that false doctrine, that sin is normal in your life. Now I'm not saying you never sin. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. But that's not the norm for people who are having deliverance and power because of the power of Jesus Christ. Uh, things happen. You, what do you do when you sin? If you sin in your life, what are you supposed to do? Repent. Look at that. everybody. Oh, I love that. You know what that means? That means growth. Because maybe two years ago I had one person go, repent. Repent. I got 30 people over. Repent. 
Because it's easy. If that creeps into your life, the first thing you do is you turn from that behavior and continue your walk with God. That is the answer. To say that, well, okay, I sin and that's a normal part of my life, so I better just go ahead and accept it. That is of the Antichrist. That, that's a teaching. So, let me ask you a question. If someone is already deceived to believe this salvation message that is not a salvation message, how easy is it going to be for the Antichrist to come in, do some miracles, and just have everybody flock? That's where we're at today. What is the salvation teaching today? Uh, in the majority of the church world, and I'm not saying in the, in the world or the flesh, but in the church world, the majority of teaching is, accept the Lord and you're saved. Without being filled with the Holy Ghost, necessarily. Without being baptized for the remission of your sins and having the blood applied at all. And without true repentance. Because repentance in the modern day Christian world is to say I'm sorry and to ask for forgiveness. And to leave out what? To leave out what? My wife got it. To leave out what? If you say sorry and ask for forgiveness, you've done two out of three. But what's the most important? Huh? To turn from the behavior. To change it. To, God's got three words for the church. If I could just put all my teaching in one set of three words. Sometimes I did, I, I did four one time and I said, three, you ready? Cut it out! Very simple. I could have just said that and closed this and gone home. If I ever did a repentance teaching, I could just do that. Cut it out and, and end it right there. That's what he wants. That's what he requires so that he can bless you. He wants us to cut it out. Get sin out of our lives. But if we've got this e easy believism teachings for a salvation message already, which is already a false teaching, how easy is it going to be to, to, to tell people this is God because of this miracle? We need to make sure that we are not deceived. We need to make sure that we are not going to fall short as, a, as a, a result of a false teaching. Now, how do we do that? How do we protect ourselves from false teaching? Because let me, for, before, before you answer that, is there going to be false teaching of the Word of God? How do we know? Because it says it in the Word of God. There'll be false teachings, false prophets, false teachers. It's, you know that. So then how do you protect yourself? Isn't it amazing how almost every sermon leads back to the same thing? How do you protect yourself? You got to get rooted and grounded in what? In the Word of God. You got to know it. See, that's your, that's your battle plan. That is your strategy. That is your, if you follow the battle plan, you can never, listen, come on, there's nobody, AA can't tell you this, uh, counseling can't tell you this, nobody can tell you this, but you can say this in God, if you will follow the battle plan, you will never lose, you can never lose the battle, you can never be defeated, you may, you may lose some, some of the stuff that goes on during the battle, but during, the ultimate, you will never lose. I should say you'll never lose the war. You might lose battles, but you will never, ever lose the war as long as you follow the battle plan. And the battle plan comes with, ca anytime you go to war, you're going to have casualties. All the seats that are empty right now, listen, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Can I preach now? Every empty seat you see in this room with all the people that we have brought to New Hope Pentecostal Church in four years, we could fill this room several times over. You're the ones that are left. Now, that being said, every empty seat in this room represents several, several casualties. Not just one, maybe even dozens. Each chair, each empty chair, not just one casualty, but several, if not dozens of casualties. You're going to have, that's, we know that. What I ask you to do is for you not to become a casualty. Each one of you, somebody say, I, I will not, I will not become a casualty. You've said it, now you better, don't be lying. If you said it, you better live it. Now I understand, based on understanding that they also, it also says in Revelation 19, that Revelation 19 says that he'll have them receive a mark of the beast. So this false prophet 
is going to encourage them to receive a mark of the beast. That's how we know that this is not speaking of the Antichrist, but of this other person who is going to be assisting the Antichrist in his ultimate goal of sending every one of you to hell. Oh, you heard that. The whole preaching, you heard that part. I'm going to say it again because I'm not cursing. This is the word of God. The, the false prophet's ultimate goal is to aid the Antichrist in sending every one of you to hell. That's why I'm here preaching to you right now. Because it's God's goal to use this prophet, who's not a false prophet, to send every one of you to heaven. That's God's goal. It's for everyone in the sound of my voice to make heaven their home by following the word of God. You know how you can tell I'm not the false prophet? Because the false prophet would never tell his own battle plan. I just exposed the whole plan of them getting you to hell. I'm not exposing my battle. You've got to understand. Well, if you think about it, God's battle plan is available to everybody. It's just so powerful you can't overcome it. You, God is so powerful you can know his plan because the devil, does the devil know God's plan? You think that the, do you think that the devil knows that he wants all of these people who aren't angels? Think, think about how angry he must be. He is, was, the, was the number one angel. But yet God, when we preached this once before, God would, would die on a cross. Put, bring himself as a man. Get on a cross and die for mankind. But not for the backslidden angels. Just, just think that for a second. He created angels, and there are good angels, and those angels are ministering angels, but the angels that backslid, they are not getting the opportunity for redemption. You are. Even, listen, even all the things we have done and the things that we do, that's God's grace and mercy. That we may mess up, and we may screw up, but if we will repent of those sins. You know, I want these services to be back to where they were before. We're, you know, and, and I understand how church works. There are times where you have highs and lows, and we have four years straight of highs with little minuscule lows. But, but I consider this a longer low in my opinion. Because if we're not recognizing, based on what I just said, if we're not recognizing the grace and mercy that he gave us to save us instead of the angels... When we are having song service and we're thinking about the fact that God gave me redemption over an angel. When I'm singing unto God, I should become emotional. I should become, oh, thank you, Jesus. I should hear the words about his blood and I should become moved by those words. So I want to encourage you as we move forward in these teachings to, allow, listen, if we don't allow this to happen, we are quenching the spirit of God. If we don't allow for ourselves to, you know, what, you know why God, uh, the devil tries to distract you? Because he doesn't want you to, be, to get that connection with God so you can have all the power to have every victory you want. So you're distracted with your family, you're distracted with your kids, you're distracted with your jobs. I'm not saying you shouldn't have those things, but we need a balance. When it comes, listen, when it comes, to, can you do me a favor? When it comes to being in the house of God, leave all your problems at the door. Bring your, cast your cares on him. Just throw them out. Because you're not here for the, you're here for him. So too many people come to the church, oh God, I need you. How about, oh God, I'm going to give you. How about, oh God, I'm just here to love you. With, oh, I'm just here to, to give you whatever I can to love you as much. To serve, you, you hear me? We need to cast our care. Listen, if we would serve him and put him first, he's going to put everything in order anyway. He's going to put everything in order anyway. Okay, I need to get moving because I don't want nobody to lose anybody. Is everybody still with me? Are we here? Oh, Lord, I got to quit now. I said, is everybody still here? Yeah. Oh, Lord. It has been prophesied by, the, by those in the Catholic circles that this last pope that we have right now will be the false prophet. I'm going to end with this because I, I, I feel like we need to move on. But this, this should help you. This should help. If anybody's a Catholic or a former Catholic in here, please don't be angry with me. Because 
It wasn't said by me. I didn't create it. There was a lot of talk about it both in Catholic circles and out of Catholic circles. But the idea is that this last, but let me show you where it makes sense. Let me tell you where it makes sense. What is the biggest church in the world right now? The Mormon church? Who said Mormon church? The Roman church. The Roman church. Oh, Mormon. I mean, they're doing good. They're door knocking, but they ain't the biggest church. The biggest church right now is the Catholic church. The second is the Muslim church. And Muslim church, that, that whole faith is growing Leaps, I mean, it's huge. It's second to the Catholic Church. And, and now, anybody heard of the word Chrislam? See, the, the new thing that we're bringing in now is this idea of mending and blending both the Catholic Church and the, and the Muslim Church. So now you've got the two biggest churches in the world coming together to be a huge force in the religious concepts of the world. Now, who is the only religious participant in the United Nations? It's the Pope. He is directly related to politics in the United Nations. Understand the United Nations is the way that they're going to create a one world government. They're going to put all, I mean there's already a one world government because you've got the United Nations making, there's, there's major, you know, several major, you know, Russia, China, major countries that are involved in the United Nations, but they actually are running everybody else. But understand that you've got these huge religions coming together already, and, and this, is the, this is the way I'm going to end this service, because this is something that you're going to hear over and over and over again, is the idea of interfaithism. Interfaithism. This is the movement that's going to usher in the one world religion. And let me tell you how it works. Interfaithism is the belief that all religions are equally valid. All religions are equally valid and they all lead to God. And then God becomes this word that is no longer Jesus. It's just this entity. I mean, already it's idolatry. The first, the, just the very mention of the word removes the state of Jesus being God. And makes God this obscure thing. This thing that becomes this morphism of whatever you want to put together. So all religions, now this is happening right now, what I, what I mentioned to you before. Uh, during Obama's first inauguration, you had a Jewish, what do you call it? A rabbi do the prayer. Then he had a evangelical Christian do a prayer. And then he had the bishop, was it a bishop, the gay bishop from the, what was it? Episcopal, Episcopal Church. He had the first gay bishop, was it a bishop or priest, from the Episcopal Church. So what we're talking about already, even as the President of the United States, including every, remember it used to be under God. This country was raised on God being the Christianity that follows Jesus. That's what this country was raised on. But now it's becoming, uh, you know, politicians won't say Jesus when they say God. They, they may go to Christian church, but they're not allowed to say Jesus. Why? Because they have to be all inclusive. They can't offend anybody else. They can't say Jesus is the true God. They say in God we trust and they make God obscure. It's the beginning of peeling away at the sovereignty of Jesus being God. So what we have here is interfaithism. You ever heard of the Unitarian Universalist Church? I used to be a Unitarian Universalist. First, I was an agnostic because when it came to religion, agnostic means I don't really know that I have the mental capacity to understand whether there be a God or not. That's a cop out. That's just you don't have faith. That's just being, or, or, or even atheism is not, under, not believing in God at all, which is, I don't even think atheists can say that. They, they, they call themselves atheists, but uh, do they really not believe in God? I'm not sure. But I used to be an agnostic, but then I turned into a Unitarian Universalist and they have removed everything about Jesus that there is. And you just go in and kumbaya your way through a service. 
They really don't have a pastor. It's kind of, whoever feels like getting up and speaking that day. I, I, uh, let me back up. I don't know exactly how all Unitarian services work. Uh, but there is no real structure. They've taken the God out of the church and just made it fellowship. It's more like a club. So if you go into a Unitarian Universalist church, you could be from seven different religions. But you know what the key focus is on everyone? No one gets into specifics about their religion. So basically, anybody who gets involved in Unitarian or interfaith believism means that you've got to let go of everything that's distinct about your religion and say, you know what, we're all the same. When the very essence of each religion shows the differences. What, what's going on now? Come on now, somebody better hear me. What's going on now? Uh, we, we can't say God in school. We're trying to take God out of schools. And what's happening to our schools now? We've never had more uh, uh, teen pregnancies. We've never had more suicide. We've never had more drug addiction. We've never had more of all these. Why? Because we took God out of churches. I'm sorry, we took God out of schools. We're, th listen, the whole purpose is to take God out of everything. Who would want to take God out of everything? The Sir, wouldn't be God. Even Jesus said, uh, a, a kingdom that tears itself down can't stand. Say that again. A kingdom divided against itself can't stand. Listen, there's only one entity that would want to take God out of everything that they can, and that's Satan. So we're going to have a one world religion, and it's going to be whatever you want to be. Whatever, you, now, the key is, if it wants to combine and have religious tolerance, it wants to combine Buddhism, Hindu, Christians, Muslims, Jews, and they call that faith in action. So now having faith is removing faith and only having faith that everything is okay with everybody. And this is how we're going to relieve war. This is how we're going to eliminate war. Uh, we have Global interdependence, is, this is the things they say, global interdependence when it comes to religion is a reality. We're all going to have to rely on everybody else. You know what I got to rely on? I got to rely on Jesus Christ. That's who I'm going to rely on. You're not going to tell me I have to rely on anything else because the word doesn't tell me that. Peaceful coexistence. Now this is, this is interesting. I'm almost done. Are you guys ready to go? There's food cooking, I'm sure. You're hungry, but I'm going to feed you. Just like Mark said, I'm going to feed you spiritual first. I, it does not mean that I think that you need to be rude to other people from other religions. And this is how the devil wants to bring in something. He masks it with a little bit of truth and then makes it false. Let me tell you how we do this. Should I go up? There was a guy. I went to Elephant Butte this weekend and I met a guy who told me he was a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, the, the apostolic of old that I used to be would be like, Jehovah's Witness, well what about this? What about this? What about this? Well what about that? You believe in this? Do you believe in that? And there would have been a big debate that would have took three hours and I would have missed all my boating. I would have stayed there and argued with that guy for three hours. Am I supposed to look at him and treat him bad and be mean to him and be disrespectful and hate him because he's not a Christian? Or the Christian, uh, how, I, how I see Christianity? No. That's the truth. We are supposed to be um, having tolerance of other religions. You know what I said to him? He said he was a, he was a Jehovah's Witness. I was like, oh, that's nice. And we, he started talking about, oh, we just need to uh, find where we, forget about the differences and just agree on everything. And I said, oh, okay, okay. Well, you know what? First of all, I'm an elephant butte and this guy is from another state. I am not going to convince this man in one conversation unless God decides that's what he wants to do. Me fighting with this person and being rude and disrespectful to this person is not going to get them saved. But what he will hear is because I told him I was a Pentecostal and I told him I was from New Hope Pentecostal Church and I told him how I feel about God and I told him that I was glad to have met him. And you know what he's going to be left with? Well, wow, those Pentecostals aren't so bad. Didn't have a snake in his pocket or nothing. You know, we need to spread, if we're going to be spreading the truth, when they see us, they shouldn't be running the other direction. So, yes, we're supposed to be nice to people. and we're, I don't necessarily think I'm going to fight with every person that I come from, from a different religion. I, just because I talk to a person, I don't necessarily argue with them about religion, does not mean that I don't care about them. I find the best way I can to incorporate God into a conversation. But understand, 
That does not mean that I should believe and agree with everything this person is saying. That does not mean that I should say, oh, you're right. We just need all men to blend and come back here and start teaching you guys that. I don't think so. That would make me a false prophet. So what we're talking about here, my friends, is making a decision. We need to make a decision. Somebody say sold out. What does that mean to be sold out? What does it mean to be sold out? I've got a couple more things here, but I need to end. I can't even go to the next portion. Uh, did someone just say amen? <laughs> what does it mean to be sold out? What I want you to do is ask yourself, am I sold out? Am I sold out? Am I in a position where I will receive nothing else but the Word of God? I will receive nothing from something that goes against the teachings of Acts 2.38. I just won't go there. I can't even allow myself to be told by someone, I don't need a, you don't need a pastor. You don't need, you don't need somebody to tell you what to do. Am I sold out to the concept of service? Am I sold out to the idea that I have got to be involved in the church? I've got to reach the lost. I've got to. Are you sold out? Let me tell you, there's a way to find out. Let's stand. There's a way to find out if you're sold out. There is going to be a one world government on the scene. There is going to be a one world economy on the scene as a result of understanding the mark of the beast. It tells us clearly that you will not be able to be a part of the economy without this mark that comes from Satan. And there's only one way to get into that is to accept that mark. There's going to be a one world economy based on that. There's, there can only be one money. There can't be all this. There's only one money that's based on the Antichrist's choice. Now if we are flexible with sin we're saying that I'm allowing come on somebody hear me this is it comes down to this if I'm flexible with sin I'm not sold out on repentance if I'm flexible I'm gonna say it again if I'm flexible with sin I am not sold out on repentance if I'm not sold out on repentance that I am going to be easier, it's going to be easier to deceive me. I will be easily deceived with sin in my